Well, I, it's a tremendous honour to be chairing what is the most exciting, dynamic and really heart-centred panel that's very, very dear to my work and my focus uh, over many, many years. And that is the greatest generational wealth transfer in the history of the world is now. Uh, in particular, of course, I, I strongly believe that there's a, a, a number of mis misconceptions that exist with regards to the ultra high net worth community, the social impact that they do behind the scenes. And if you understand the values and the objectives behind uh, what is silently going on, you would possibly gain a, a greater appreciation and, of course, feel a, a, a greater opportunity to uh, collaborate, co-create and co-elevate one another. So again, it's uh, a great honor to be chairing this on behalf of Harassus Global Meeting 2021. Um, the real purpose is, of course, this virtual roundtable is due to that substantial flow, flow of private wealth transfer occurring over the forthcoming generation from the baby boomers to the next generation inheritors. However, there is that lack of understanding on key trends that will play a major role going forward, uh, and particularly the values, the interests, uh, and the areas of focus the next generation may take. In the US alone, and this is a really a monumental uh, statistic, there will be 68 trillion transferred from one generation to the next by 2060. That is an extraordinary amount of, of funds to flow from one generation to the next. But the key thing is that the at the apex of this entire phenomenon is that 1% comprising the ultra high net worth uh, and family office community and this next generation of theirs, which are often very misunderstood as I touched upon before and the least accessible. And just so, so people can clarify that are new to this world, a family office, uh, if you're not aware, is a, 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 pri a private uh, office for the um, managing the private investments of a family where they have a net worth or investable assets in excess of 100 million US dollars. So we'll use that as a, a rough uh, um, definition for today. Many questions that our panelists and myself uh, are asked often include the what's the best manner of connecting with and collaborating with family offices, ultra high net worths and the next gen? How do we understand the differing interests, objectives and values that patriarchs possess in comparison to their next generation? How should you go about forging a long-term relationship based on the three C's that I mentioned before, collaboration, co-creation and co-elevation uh, with this most important and growing investor, entrepreneur, artist, creator, philanthropist, social impact edge walker, um, not only during the COVID pandemic risk time period, but also into the next generation and so on. So without further ado, uh, to answer some of those burning questions that may have arisen from time to time, uh, it's my tremendous honour to introduce the topic of this discussion uh, in its formal description. The greatest generational wealth transfer in history is now. The global community of millennial inheritors are known to be ESG conscious and tech savvy and lead the charge in this tidal wave of generational wealth transfer. But what are values, vision and objectives of this socially focused 1%? And what, what will the direction be for this new breed of private wealth leaders? And what will it take to galvanize a new order of positive social impact and great wealth distribution? Introducing now our uh, distinguished panelists. Firstly, uh, dialing in uh, from uh, Mexico and the United States is Gina Diaz Barroso, who is president and chief executive officer of DIARC uh, Holdings, Mexico. Welcome, Gina. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, from the United States, uh, Dr. Jocelyn Lera, who is a senior gender integration consultant with Stanford University's Global Center for Gender Equality out of the USA. Welcome, G Welcome uh, Jocelyn. And uh, also from the United Kingdom, Ian Morgan, who is the head of transactions for Westcore Europe, a single family office, USA and UK. Welcome, Ian. Hi there. Good to be here. And Eduardo Barillo, who is the CEO of Ecclesian Family Office out of Mexico and the United States. Welcome, Eduardo. Thank you, Peter. Well, it's an honor to have you all here. And uh, I'd really love to kick things off if you could just all share with us uh, in about a minute so our audience can understand a little more about your backgrounds, 
uh, your areas of focus and what uh, really helped you gain interest in the greatest wealth transfer in history. Why don't we start with you, Gina? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Well, um, I am. Uh, I started as a real estate developer, but actually, I changed uh, my my definitely my purpose on education, and I think that that is where I really came across this amazing great wealth transfer, uh, because I deal a lot with young, the young generation. I founded a university uh, about 14 years ago, and I, I definitely uh, think that uh, not very many people know about this amazing wealth transfer. And I think now uh, I work a lot in, in making people understand the great opportunity we have here. So I, I do work, uh, although I handle all, all my, my, I mean, all my businesses that I have several, my 70% uh, of my time is devoted to understanding the new generation, not only millennials, Gen Zs as well. And I, I am very happy to devote my time <clears throat> and effort to education. So um, that, that's who I am, and uh, and I know that you know all the business is wrong, but education is my passion and my purpose. Brilliant, and J uh, Jocelyn, same thing. Uh, how did you? Um, what's your, a bit about your background, and how did you find yourself connecting with the Great Wealth Transfer? <laughs> Thank you. So it's great to be here. Thank you, Peter. Um, so my background is in public health. I have been working for the last 20 plus years in the U.S., Latin America. My family is from Chile. Um, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East, uh, on public health challenges, including HIV AIDS, gender-based violence, uh, gender equality um, across sectors. And I was invited uh, to become, to join a variety of wonderful communities uh, that include next-gen inheritors, uh, such as Nexus and the Next Gen Track of, or the Intergen Track of the Family Office Association, basically to join as a thought partner uh, and as a supporter for uh, young wealth holders who want to use the wealth for good. And so, for the past five years, I've had the the privilege of of being in these uh, communities where there's a really dynamic interchange between um, philanthropists, impact investors. Uh, young inheritors and, and folks who are uh, doing the work in the field and, and doing the research uh, to, to build dynamic community, build partnerships and collaborations, learn together and so on, to have a thriving community that is impact focused. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what brought here and it's a time of super exciting possibility. And we're very, very, very much welcome, uh, Josie. And uh, Ian as well, same thing. A bit about your background and how did you get involved with this phenomenon of the great wealth transfer? Sure. Um, very briefly, my, my background's in real estate, corporate finance, and private equity investing. Um, and um, my, but my role since 2013 um, has been effectively helping um, a single family office, um, two different single family offices. Um, one was a, uh, an Eastern European uh, principal, and he, uh, he was sort of a self-made guy, and, his, um, and our business was to go out and find you know, good investments and deploy capital. Um, and you know, there, the, there was also a second generation there who's just coming up, and the idea was to you know, preserve capital for them and also you know, integrate them into the business so they can, they can you know, start to assume leadership roles and, and mature as, as business leaders. Um, and it's the same situation now. Um, I'm um, looking after, uh, you know, basically family office capital for a U.S.-based um, individual, and um, and we focus on investments um, in the U.K. and Western Europe. Um, and there, there's also, you know, a second generation of inheritors to be to be <laughs> inheritors to be that are that are coming up, and um, and it's it's a similar situation. We're we're bringing them into the business as well slowly. And, uh, and uh, you know, with the, with the idea that, you know, we're going to be running this day to day for the next, for the foreseeable future, but eventually, you know, we need, we're going to have a new generation coming in and, and we need to understand, you know, what their priorities are um, uh, you know, as things evolve. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. And Eduardo, same question. Uh, I'd love to hear a bit about your background and uh, what led you into this phenomenon on uh, the great world transfer. Thank you, Peter. Um, well, my background is uh, primarily in technology and finance, uh, but with a big passion for the arts. 
And uh, for me, it's very important to relate with, with other leaders that are looking to collaborate and committed to advance uh, positive social change. I believe that uh, technology will be the key driver for that. And um, we, believe, we believe at our company that um, education, banking, and, uh, and communication need to be um, decentralized and should be um, looked at carefully. So uh, that's the reason why I got involved. And uh, we, we like to integrate innovative and creative technologies into the mainstream cultures, using the understanding of gener generational diversity in order to thrive. And uh, mostly we focus on blockchain. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Yeah, and that, that leads in because I think it's very important to understand the backgrounds and the core values behind uh, an individual's mission in life and, and particularly in this, this all-important area of wealth transfer. But in key, in key look, uh, what do you feel are the values, the responsibilities, uh, and the role of the top 1% of all inheritors um, presently today? And how do these differ between the patriarchal and the next gen? Um, Gina, why don't we start with you? Um. I think it's it's very interesting because you know I think it's a very good combination be, between the patriarchs and the next ne next generation. You know, we we all have to sort of uh, uh, work together. I think the generations one to the other, but I but I think that the, we have a as 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 let's say as patriarchs of, of our wealth, we have to understand how the next generation thinks and the next generation will act. Uh, we don't. Uh, one of the things that I find difficult is when this. Uh, Creators of wealth, let's say, uh, want to um, want to put the same way as they think to the next generation, or, or want to control exactly what they do in order to give the, you know, the, the, the funds to the next generation and to see what they're doing. I think they are brilliant. I think the next generation are brilliant, and I do think that although experience, which is basically what we can leave to the next generation, our experience, our the way we we uh, dealt with the problems that we did, the way we, we created this wealth. That's a very important thing that we could inherit, much more important than actually the funds. But I think we should let them do and help them through this way, through this path, and, and let them act the way they want to act with our help in experience, not our control with the money. Because that's something that needs to be, in my opinion, that, that what kills I'm very much into Eduardo's, you know, I, I was, uh, I was, I started my life as a creative person. I studied design, my university is design, media and technology. And, uh, and now obviously I work with, uh, it will come later, but now my, my, my other passion is women and diversity. So I do think that we have to let them act and forget that we control, and money does not control. And I think that's something that patriarchs need to think and, and the next gen need to feel. That we're not controlling, we're letting me let them act, you know, and let them li literally change the world because they are capable of. So that's that's my that's my thought. I, I couldn't agree more. In fact, I, I completely resonate as I also have a, a financial and a creative background. And it's amazing how you get such amazing ideas from both sides. And if only they both understood how the others thought, we could uh, you know, create an even much more exciting and dynamic world. But it's part of the bridge. I think I guess that makes us uh, edge walkers. And everyone here I see is in some ways an edge walker, creating new ideas and bridging uh, new paths between uh, diverse groups. But again, Josie, same question. Uh, the values, the responsibilities, um, you feel the top 1% of inheritors presently play, and uh, how do these differ between the patriarchal and the next gen? Mm -hmm. well, so I can speak to what I've encountered in these communities that I've been part of. I, I see a huge desire to be fostering positive social impact. Um, I see a sense of responsibility to critically examine uh, the legacy of their families, the ways in which their families uh, generated the wealth to begin with, and then thinking critically about the work that they want to be doing in the world themselves personally, through their philanthropy, investing, through their daily work. Um, and in many cases, I, I've seen friends who have a desire to shift the legacy. Uh, you know, So for example, a friend of mine whose family's company made locks, uh, including locks which were used in... Uh, slavery, uh, talking about wanting to work now to promote human freedom. Another friend whose family made their wealth with oil, talking about going from oil to soil, and he now works in regenerative farming and 
and so on. And so um, I think that it's important on the one hand to acknowledge that there's uh, more progressive values, more possibly, probably more of a social impact theme in young inheritors. But we also, I think it's important not to assume that all young inheritors will have that uh, type of goal automatically. And I think it's really important uh, to continue building these kinds of supportive, dynamic, impact-focused communities that can bring inheritors together with uh, folks who are working for social change in different spheres to have that cross-pollination and to, to continue supporting the growth of that culture of, of uh, valuing social change and impact work. Um, and because I do work in gender, I want to emphasize also that there's a, there's a whole area, a, a growing field uh, called gender mainstreaming or gender integration, where in any area of work that one is engaged in in any, any sector, uh, one can critically and systematically integrate an intersectional gender lens, which is, in other words, looking at how does my business or how does my impact investing or how does my philanthropy, how can I wield that to maximally benefit uh, everybody, <laughs> but particularly groups that have been that are have been disadvantaged? How can I use that work to simultaneously address gender inequality? Um, and when you inject that lens, it actually leads to better business outcomes uh, and more impactful philanthropy and so on. So that's something that I'd also like to see as part of the discourse uh, in these spaces. No, I, I could have those um, as well that you've um, very much well lead a few. And, and of course, you're a, a tremendous thought leader in the gender equality area, Men's Story Project and others. It, yeah, that's what really creates the seed I, in my opinion, for what could be a giant oak of, of impact going forward into the next generation. And Ian, again, same question. I mean, what do you feel are the values, the responsibilities, and the role of the top 1% that they presently play? And how do these differ between the patriarchal and the next gen? That's a good question. Um, I have seen, in my, I can only speak to the family offices I've dealt with and the, and the, and the principles that I've dealt with. Um, and I will say they, you know, they, the old generation, the patriarchal generation, in my experience, has been focused on philanthropy, but also with a philanthropy that's relevant to that that individual's experience. So, for example, um, you know, we one of the guys um, principals had come up from nothing, and and really the, the accelerant to his career trajectory was um, a technical education um, and an engineering education. And so, you know, what he did was he just built a school, built a, a sort of a technical kind of a technical academy um, to, you know, de benefit a disadvantaged community. Um, very direct, very hands-on kind of, I had these benefits, this, I had this impact in my life and I'm going to give it on. Now, the next generation, I'd say two things. They, they want to um, make their mark in the business. Um, and, and probably they're not going to be very disruptive in my personal opinion. They're going to want to preserve the capital base that's here and, and, and be a steward of that, of that wealth. But ultimately over time, um, you know, the ESG, um, you know, they, they are, they, they want to, they want to future proof their, their, their portfolio also. And, and ESG is a, is a big part of that. Their, their thinking is, is very different about ESG versus, um, I hate to say it, versus the last generation. I think the last generation thinks a little bit more um, maybe pragmatically and, and directly. I don't want to say it's impragmatic to think about ESG, but um, that's, been, that's been my experience. Yeah. And uh, again, uh, Eduardo, same, same question. Your thoughts on the values, responsibility, and the role of the top 1% that they play today, and how does this differ, uh, differ between the patriarchs and the next gens? I believe to protect uh, life experience and freedom, we should be designing inclusive environments to ensure the generational diversity, fundamental values, interests, and focus, so they can be integrated as an intricate part of creating and recreating the societies of the future, to encourage each human to reach its maximal, maximal potential, protecting, preserving, and increasing the future gen generational integrity. Mm -hmm. The core values are taught at home and cannot be substituted by money nor delegating it to employees to replace parenting or brotherhood. 
we need to carry down what can be carried down responsibly to each person and nothing more. So we're not just worried about preserving capital. The rest we want to contribute to areas of, that, of need of impact. We believe that teaching our children about integrity, responsibility, and humility so that what is given to them is not a burden to self and others and not to worry so much about credit. Indeed. Indeed. Yes, and uh, and that leads into our next next question, As, and this is from your own unique perspective and interests. What do you feel is the most appropriate direction forward the next generation should take when it comes to positive social impact, financial stability, uh, and greater wealth distribution during this uh, coming transfer of wealth, Gina? Well, I'm very, very optimistic. Honestly, I think the timing is perfect. You know, I think that be between between the, the way I see the next generations coming, uh, because, you know, for us, uh, even talking about gender, uh, you know, we struggle with gender. I'm always, I mean, I'm always struggling with diversity and gender because it has to be natural. For them, it's natural. You know, they, they grew with it. So that we don't have to, to, to push anything. So I'm very optimistic on this. Uh, but I also think that one of the things that, that is important, I, in my opinion, it's, the, the switch between collaboration and, and competing. You know, at, at our, when we were young, I remember everything was about competition. Companies were competing against each other. I think now everything is about collaboration. And I do think that if you collaborate, there's nothing that m would make you richer in all ways than collaborating with others. And, and our biggest problems, biggest challenges, nobody can do it alone. Because what are, what are our biggest challenges? You know, obviously dealing with a pandemic, that was an enormous challenge. Uh, climate crisis, incredible challenge. The water shortage, food shortage, you know, everything that is extreme poverty, unemployment, you know, those things are on top of us as the biggest challenges. And nobody, no country, no person can deal with this alone. So I think that the next generations understand, and if not, it's our, our job to make them do it, to collaborate with each other, with different family offices, different countries, different people, different organizations, to be able to make these solutions work and to end with these issues that are happening around us. Because I do think that now is the era of collaboration versus competition everywhere. And mm -hmm. the companies that have not done that, honestly, they have gone down, many of them. We have hundreds of examples that this is not the forum to talk about them, but I do think that there's hundreds of examples of companies that were so secret that now are in the grave and companies that decided to open and be collaborative there in the, you know, as, as a very multi-billion dollar companies. So I do think that as a, as a new generation, you have to understand that you have to collaborate with others in order to change the big challenges that the world has. Now, thank you very much, Gina. And same question, Jody. I mean, from your unique perspectives, what do you feel is the most appropriate direction forward that next gen can take when it comes to positive social impact, financial stability, and greater wealth um, distribution during this uh, great wealth transfer? Thank you. Well, so I think part of taking strategic action in the world, um, again, is 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 incorporating this kind of intersectional gender lens uh, to analyze any kind of initiative that you're working on. So, so my role on this panel is to, you know, to bring this, this piece of the perspective. Um, you know, people question, you know, how, how can we, you know, gender integration sounds so amorphous or confusing or, you know, is there measurement, are there metrics? And so what I want to emphasize is that, um, integrating attention to, to gender, to uh, looking at who has been systematically disadvantaged uh, and what are the dynamics and the needs of those different communities. When you build that uh, analysis into your work, be it um, philanthropic giving or uh, design of programs or also thinking across the value chain of a company, right? Um, you can always be thinking about how can we maximize the benefits uh, to promote gender equality in terms of our hiring, our staffing, our, our board representation. Um, what kinds of products and services can we be creating to maximally benefit people? Um, what are the internal policies of our business? You know, who are we funding philanthropically? You know, so, and, and I want to 
emphasize that there are also, you know, systematic ways to analyze uh, and evaluate program impacts or business impacts with metrics. So it's a field uh, of practice. And there are consultants and advisory groups that can support this work. And I just think that integrating that intersectional gender analysis into all kinds of work should become a standard. And so I'm, that's one of the things I just want to repeat. And I think it's, it's not something that needs to be seen as an add-on or optional, but rather if you want to maximize impact both sectorally and advance gender equality at the same time, and also prevent unintended harms, uh, it's an important lens to be uh, making a standard of practice. Yeah. Yeah. Ian as well, love for you to weigh in on this, uh, on this topic. I mean, the appropriate direction moving forward the next generation should take when it comes to social impact, financial stability, greater wealth distribution. Yeah, I mean, at the risk of sounding a little grandiose, I mean, I think the next generation has realized that it's time to reimagine the global economy. Um, and part of that's around sustainability and, and, um, and other things. And, and within sustainability, I think um, the trend towards um, decarbonization is going to be a, a major, major thing over the next 50 years at least. And, um, and you know, the past generation has kind of missed that boat a little bit and, 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 and missed a lot of opportunities uh, to do that. Uh, but, I mean, you look, at, you look at someone like Elon Musk and he's got 46 million Twitter followers and, and you realize people are really paying attention to him. Whatever he's saying um, is, is really registering with people. And so, um, and, uh, you know, he just has, the, you know, I, th I think people are, are, are starting to, in the next generation is starting to envision um, a, a more sustainable base for our economy at this point. Yeah. And Eduardo, same question. Um, again, what do you think the, the role of the next generation is regarding our sort of social impact, financial stability, and greater wealth distribution? Well, Madlow's hierarchy of needs need to be beyond political views. The need for self-actualization at the top will become an asset for positive social impact. For me, the um, telecommunications are the roads of the present, are the future, and they should be provided for free. Internet should be free for everybody, and they should be accessed globally. This way they could have access to many tools like education, training, job creation, and um, also banking. Banking should be essential for everybody. So all that understanding is what uh, should be fulfilled to the lower level needs. Indeed, indeed. And look, we'll, we'll try and limit this uh, answer to one minute if we can. So Gina, are, are there any key lessons you've learned from yours or another's family dynamics that you feel has brought positive collaboration and change amongst the family? Oh uh, yes, uh, like one of the lessons that we we learned from from my my family and from Moss and from, from from me to my children is that wealth comes with responsibility. You know, it's 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 not only receiving money; it's receiving a great deal of responsibility. And also, an important thing is that we you have to understand the difference between philanthropy and impact investing. Mm -hmm. You know, because I think now is the time to really put yourself into the impact investing shoes besides our philanthropy section. Now it's a very important opportunity to invest in impact investing. And that doesn't mean you're not, you're not going to get a return. You're going to get the same return as if it was an impact. But you will do good for the world. So those are two lessons that we I learned and I'm teaching to my next gen. Same thing, Jocelyn. I mean, your, your observation of all the different next gens and families that you've uh, encountered. I mean, what as far as the family dynamics is concerned, what do you feel has brought positive collaboration and change amongst the family? I think that when young people act in accordance with their values, uh, sometimes it can bring other family members along who maybe weren't as sure about it uh, initially. Uh, so young people can inspire the, old, the older generation. Uh, one nice example of this is an initiative called Bank Forward, uh, which is an initiative of uh, some Rockefeller family members. Uh, and they actually formed an organization that's advocating for major banks to divest from fossil fuels. And this is a, a family that is standard oil. Uh, so that's just one example of, of uh, young people leading and uh, they've brought some of their uh, 
older family members, you know, along. Uh, and and you know, that's one nice one. There's another friend uh, who is working on a socially con conscious uh, film business with her mother. And so they've become even closer now that they're working together. So working in mission driven initiatives together uh, can lead family members to become closer. Indeed. 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 Um, as far as the family dynamic you've been a part of, uh, what do you feel has brought positive collaboration and change amongst the family? Yeah, Ian. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I would say giving the younger generation or the next generation, um, you know, the chances, put, uh, put them in leadership positions early, uh, not really coddle them. Um, and, you know, you might say, throw them in the deep end of the pool and, and see what happens, um, you know, and, and see, you know, when you've got multiple siblings, um, you know, see how, see how that, see how that goes. Um, but give people, you know, areas of responsibility and let them, let them run with it. Um, cause otherwise, you know, how else are they gonna, are they gonna come up and, and be stewards for the organization in the, in the future? That, that'd be my, my two cents. Yeah, and brilliant. And and same question, Eduardo. I mean, what do you think in your family dynamics is more positive collaboration and change amongst the family? Well, I mean, um, in terms of collaboration and responsibility, we teach that at home with our children. Um, so they're always doing stuff uh, for the for the house and and doing uh, their own chores and helping with everything. And in the investment side. We've invested with very young entrepreneurs, and that is not just like throwing the money out there and seeing if it works. We have to handheld and and be very very involved because of the importance of the of the mission behind it. And uh, we understand that uh, things change, and they need to show resilience, and we need to discover things. And when something's that important to us, we we nurture it. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed, and that leads into our, our actually our, our next question: um, What role does entrepreneurship? technology, social impact, philanthropy, creativity, a global outlook, and other endeavors, all these endeavors independent of the family, uh, play in the lives of the next generation. And are the next gens, given that freedom to explore these options by the patriarchal generation? Gina, let's start with you. I couldn't hear the last part because I had, I listened to some echo there. So yeah, what was uh, the last you may want to mute. Eduardo, you, you may want to mute. Thank you. Yeah, as I was saying, yeah, 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 that's brilliant. It's just yeah, the role of entrepreneurship, technology, social impact, philanthropy, creativity, um, a global outlook, yeah, and, inde and endeavors basically independent of the family. Are next gens encouraged and given this freedom to explore these options by the patriarchs in the, in your family or others you know? Yes. Well, in my family, it's definitely it's a yes. I mean, I have um, I have uh, five children, and they all have their their own business. They all are entrepreneurs. In a, they have a, they have a content. They're, two of them are content developers. They, are, they have a film uh, company. They are the biggest in Mexico. And my other daughter has a tech company uh, in Los Angeles. And another, another daughter is a design studio, pretty important in New York. So they all, they all do their, th their thing. I encourage them to do their thing outside of the family. And we also get together as, as a family business. You know, we have, a, we have an important family family office, but but they do their thing. And I agree definitely on, on on let them let them go to the end of the pool. You know, to the deepest. I love that that thing because I, I think that they have to to see that they can do it, and you are able to see who swims better. You know, who is the, who is the the Phelps of your family. So <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that it is important. I'm definitely. Uh, I don't like to 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 have children very close to me and very protected. I like to be to see how they are on their own that they can if they if they are hungry they find what they, they can eat. If they're cold they find the blanket. If they need a place to sleep they will find it. And I think that's the way my children have been raised and they all have successful companies. So I think that that's the story of my family and I definitely think that they should do whatever they they are passionate about doing with one thing. I said it before. Wealth comes with, with responsibility, values, and helping others. So that's something that is it's tattooed in our family. 
Yeah, and so, same question, Josie. In, in one minute, if we could limit to a minute, if, if possible, what role does entrepreneurship, technology, impact, philanthropy, creativity, the global outlook, and these in, endeavors independent of the family uh, play in the lives of the next gen? And uh, are they encouraged and given the freedom to pursue these by the patriarchs? Um, well, what I've seen is uh, friends who are doing it either with or without encouragement. You know, so so regardless of what family has to say, uh, doing things in the world that will that express who they are. Um, and, you know, so most of my friends are, are supported by their families, um, but I do have some who, who've encountered resistance and are, and are doing it anyway and, and really beautifully and boldly um, building things in the world that, that reflect their values, uh, which are more progressive and more impact focused. So, you know, and I think that in any field, one can work for good. Any any field uh, can be can be worked in for good. Yeah. And so, uh, encourage. Yeah. I mean, I, our business is a very um, I don't want to say primitive business, but it's it's not that innovative. You know, we invest in assets that are producing good cash flows or have the possibility to invest good cash flows, and that's worked. Uh, for generations. Um, the next generation is much more, I'd say, much more creative and imaginative about about how to build businesses. And, and you know, these the two things that jumped out were entrepreneurial spirit and, and tech. Um, and they're going to be, um, they're going to be way better at, at identifying new opportunities um, along those lines um, than, than previous generations, I, 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 I believe. Um, so, but yeah, but definitely tech and you see this I, in my experience, you see it a lot in terms of, um, the second generation now being very involved in tech and things that are more, more forward looking in terms of how, how the world is, is changing. Yeah, indeed. And, and same, same, same question. That's very interesting because uh, you're very, very tech and innovative focused, uh, innovation focused, uh, Eduardo. Uh, so your thoughts, um, are next gen's encouraged and given the freedom to explore these options by the patriarchal generation. I think as, as the as the world is changing so much, the focus on labor and economy will be more on the philosophical thinkers, humanitarian and impact initiatives, as well as the creativity in the arts and science. Um, for me, AI is going to take care of most of the uh, other stuff. So the, the entrepreneurial the entrepreneur spirit has to be essential to feel new ideas and also the core values. So building the right relationships having integrity, and also be able to transition the tasks of the past into the contributions of the future. Technology drives the speed of the change and invigorates the entrepreneur to see further possibilities for positive social impact. So for this, we believe it requires the collaboration of a consorted system of philanthropic actions at global scale. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and that's a topic that we could uh, elaborate upon in detail. In fact, it even warrants its own panel, I think, uh, Eduardo. Um, but let's, um, let's, let's make this short and sharp so we want to give our audience some real, real gold nuggets of insight that they can take away and practically execute in their own lives or think about deeply so it helps their perspectives in a much greater way. So look, in 30 seconds, as a special gift and insight for our audience here at Harassus, if you had to take one or a maximum two, uh, insights you feel is most important about either the patriarchal generation or the next gen's perspective, their focus, their mindset in the great wealth transfer. What would that be, Gina? 30 seconds. To me, just that uh, I think it would be the education or to me to, you know, to educate and try to help the people that don't have the chance to be educated and to talk about diversity not as giving a chance to women, as giving the world a chance to be more productive and to give the world a chance to be even. You know, we have to change the language on diversity. Those are the two things that I would definitely keep on keep on working on that. And your key 30 second insight, um, Josie? Love to hear it. Uh, well, one thing I wanna point out is that around 70% of this wealth transfer is predicted to be happening to women because women will be inheriting from husbands who are tend to be older and men also tend to die a little bit earlier than women, around five years earlier than women. Uh, and so they'll be inheriting from partners and also uh, from parents. And 
women tend to be more uh, philanthropic, more involved in, uh, you know, due diligence, volunteering more, ESG impact investing. You know, so there's that. But I think that re regardless of that fact, we just need to be promoting a culture of uh, social consciousness and impact for all new inheritors. Mm -hmm. And your major insight. Yeah, I would say I will be focused on on the patriarchal generation. In that, um, you know, just to be my advice would be to be open to new ideas um, that the new generation are bringing, and to relinquish control uh, sooner rather than later. You know, going back to my comment about deep ends of, of pools. Yeah, and Eduardo, again, your thirty second insight you'd like to share with our audience. Well, the first part it would be like, uh, don't rely on others to take care of your children and so decadence and destruction. I would give them the time to fulfill their duties and give them the inheritance in life in all shapes and forms while teaching them that the only inheritance worth is the one of the next life and the fruits which they can provide as a service to society. Otherwise, they will not value it. The other part of the question would be that if we had a artificial intelligence built as a support system for generations to create scenarios together, such as you know parents and kids to build the future as a global community, we could create envir environments in balance with nature and you know cultures, and could be a catalyst for t transformation. Mm -hmm. Indeed, and uh, I'll also let you take on the, uh, the uh, final question for the day, uh, which is: What is the legacy and positive impact you or your family would like to instill and leave behind for the community and future generations? Eduardo, I'll let you expand upon that for thirty seconds. The legacy that. We would like to do is we would like to reduce distances overall through communication and any form of uh, artistic expression and access to information. We'd like to contribute to our security, education, freedom, and promote the culture of peace and reconciliation. Uh, we believe a lot into you know shaping a culture with uh, without uh, violence, and we need to focus on preventing preventing it and treating it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Ian, what's the enduring legacy uh, that you or the family you represent, represent would like to instill and leave behind the community and the next gen? 30 seconds. It, very briefly, it's probably all around education um, and, um, and, and whether that's in a philanthropic vein or, uh, you know, a for-profit, but uh, with, with an impact, those are probably the focuses, uh, at least of the families that I'm dealing with. Josie, 30 seconds on your legacy. I'd like to do work that helps uh, increase equity and social justice in the world uh, with regard to gender, race, ethnicity, just doing work that helps all people thrive equally. And Gina, uh, you legacy? Like well, for me, for? Yeah, for, for me, the legacy was definitely in the way I founded a university. And, you know, it's been, it's been a great thing that I did. But now my, my legacy also is on diversity, uh, gender, race, and diversity that I started Dahlia, Dahlia Empower, which is a lifelong education project to help women reach their personal and professional goals through education again. So those are my two legacies now. Well, look, I found this really exciting. Uh, there's amazing takeaways here. And ladies and gentlemen, I, I don't know about you, but I can't wait to be going back into the, the world now, taking some of these key insights and, uh, and going forward with, with a number of these positive actions and really extraordinary ideas that we've shared. I think if the uh, great generational wealth transfer had uh, stewards, patriarchs and, and leaders as, as our panelists here, I think we'd be in a very, very uh, safe and very intriguing uh, future going forward. So, look, in, in, this is the, the conclusion of our uh, discussion here on the great uh, wealth transfer. And uh, in summary, you've basically gained uh, greater insight into the perspectives on if the next gens as the 1% of all inheritors will lead to positive impact, financial stability and greater wealth distribution, how the next gen differs to the patriarchal generation, the legacy and the positive social impact each wishes to instill for the community and future generations. And of course, my favorite always, and when I see a, a master of an area, I always have to ask for that one golden insight. Uh, and that is, of course, that takeaway shared by a panelist that they feel is most important for the great wealth transfer. We strongly encourage all of our distinguished audience to take action with this tremendous knowledge and insights today and welcome create. Uh, uh, we welcome basically a, a spirit of collaboration, 
co-creation and co-elevation, which has been a, a hallmark and made Harassus so successful over the years. Therefore, for further thoughts or questions, you're welcome to reach out to Harassus directly. Myself, via uh, my email at inquiries, that's inquiries with an E, at ATOS Investments, that's A-E-T-O-S investments.com, uh, via LinkedIn at Peter J.R. Aylwin, that's A-Y-L-W-I-N, or website www.adosinvestments.com, or of course, our distinguished panelists via their social media or details provided with their bios. This concludes the greatest generational uh, tra wealth transfer in history. And uh, it's, it's been a tremendous pleasure from my side. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for your extremely uh, insightful viewpoints that are going to be of, of tremendous value to our audience, uh, the committed staff of Harassus, and particularly Harassus Chairman Frank Jürgen Richter for his dedication and commitment, which has made this entire virtual roundtable possible. Ladies, gentlemen, and our distinguished guests, I wish you great success, prosperity, and safety during these uh, interesting times and a most exciting rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank